Okay, welcome back everybody to another one of my model review videos. I want to apologize right off the bat. I got a little bit of a laryngitis thing going on, so my voice might sound a little croaky at times. Um, so today's video uh, model that I'm going to look at, as I'm sure you've seen from the title, is the new ICM um, B26. Hey, and now uh, this is, I'm going to do this a little differently. Normally I do video reviews of models that I am about to start building, uh, but in this case, I don't know when I want to build this one, but it is a newer model, it is in high demand, and I figure it's probably something that everybody out there would like to see as a good sort of in-box review of what you get in this kit. Uh, so just a bit of a backstory, the kit is, like I said, quite a high demand kit. Uh, ever since ICM released uh, the first A26 Invader kit and announced they were going to be doing a whole family, uh, a lot of people were very interested in getting one of these. Um, it's never been done in 148 scale before. Prior to this, the only way to get a, uh, a, a B26K a model would be using the old monogram kit with the cutting edge resin conversion. And that conversion was always a little pricey. Uh, especially now that Cutting Edge has been shut down for a number of years, they're very hard to find and very expensive when they do pop up. Um, and the monogram kit has some, depending on who you talk to, uh, some um, in small but not necessarily insignificant shape issues apparently with the fuselage. So a lot of people were weary of doing that conversion. And there's a lot of work involved and, and whatnot to make it work. So this is an out-of-the-box kit. It's great. Uh, a lot of people were happy when this came out. The downside to it is because it's a hot commodity, it's been selling out everywhere. Uh, I had one uh, kind of, I, I wouldn't say put on hold, but re waiting at the local hobby shop. Um, and I would go in and ask, and they weren't delivered yet, and go in and ask, weren't delivered yet. And then when I did go in and ask, we said, yeah, we got them, we're sold out. Uh, basically had just enough to cover sort of pre-orders and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and uh, was sold out. And... <coughs> Not sure when the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and he's not sure when the next order is going to come in because ICM being a um, Ukrainian company with the current situation in Ukraine, there's no way of even knowing if these kits are going to be produced again. You know, if the molds get destroyed or the company disappears or whatnot, then uh, we might not see them again. So I decided to hunt the internet to find... Um, to find one, uh, I managed to stag one from uh, squadron.com, paid a little bit more than I would have liked for it, but knowing that it might not be around, I figured it was worth it, uh, not affiliated for squadron.com in any way, just that's where I happened to get it from. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's where I got it from. Now just a bit of a backstory uh, on it, because as you'll notice, it is uh, labeled as a B26K counter invader um, and there was a bit of a confusion over the nomenclature for these aircraft because during World War II when this built there was the Douglas A26 invader and the Martin B26 Marauder. I'll put pictures of them up here and they were two different aircraft made by two different manufacturers but one was an attack and one was a bomber. Now at the end of World War II the B26 Marauder was for the most part retired, and the A-26 was kept in service. Now, in 1947, when the U.S. Air Force was officially formed, they sort of realigned their nomenclature, and uh, they dropped a couple of, of, of titles and moved some stuff around, so instead of being a P for pursuit with the P-51, it became a fighter, so F-51, uh, things like the P-80 became the F-80. Um, the attack nomenclature was dropped, so any aircraft that was still in service that was classified as an a attack aircraft got renamed. So the A-26 Invader got renamed the B-26 Invader because the B-26 Marauder was no longer in service and was gone. Thank you for watching, so it became the B-26 Invader. In and it was used as that throughout see, the, uh, in the Korean War. Near the end of the Korean War, the aircraft were retired and uh, many people still called them A-26s even though they were officially designated the B-26 um, by the U.S. Air Force. Now that also being said when they were in service as the A26 there was the A26B which was the gun nose version and the B26 so A26C which was the glass nose version now that matters here in a minute because at the beginning of the Vietnam War uh, they realized they needed a counterinsurgency aircraft an aircraft that could fly low slow get into tight spots loiter for quite a long time and um, you know, do the, the, the close air support that was needed for some of these ground forces. Uh, so aircraft such as the A, uh, A1 Sky Raider and the A26 Invader were brought back 
um, into service. I mean, the A20, A1 was still in service. The, uh, the A26, B26 was basically retired. They were brought back and used for that role until newer aircraft, things like the Mohawk and the Bronco, came into being to replace these in the COIN counterinsurgency, the COIN uh, mission. So the A26s slash B26s at the time were brought out of retirement. They were sent to Onmark Aviation, which had done a number of conversions on these A26s to bring them up to higher standards for some of the uh, you know third world countries, some of the South African countries, and sorry, South American countries and some African countries who were using these. So they were tasked to bring these up to standards to be used by the U.S. Air Force. And some of those compare, uh, involved, uh, it was replaced with this eight-gun nose, and the World War II versions didn't have this eight-gun nose. This was a later modification, but these were installed. Uh, more powerful engines were installed. It had a bigger prop. Uh, you'll see here in a little bit the difference in props, but they had uh, squared off props. They were actually, I believe, a DC-7 prop that was cut down in diameter and used. It had a different intake installed due to some overheating issues. Uh, the turrets were deleted and fared over. The rear gunner's area became a electronics operator, radio and navigators and whatnot, and uh, radar and stuff. So our electronics guy to help coordinate attack. Um, the rudder was replaced, a, or the earlier fabric rudder was replaced with a metal covered rudder that was slightly wider and that necessitated a slight extension in the rear fuselage to make up for that difference in, in depth. As well, um, the wings have strengthening straps installed, uh, four hard points under each wings for weapons, and the tip tanks. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to tell is they've got the big tip tanks on them. Only the uh, the, ca the uh, on mark invaders had those tip tanks. So all of those combined were the major changes that went through to make the counter invader. So the B-26 counter invader was brought into Southeast Asia to be used in the COIN mission, and they were to be based in Thailand. But at the time, Thailand had a rule that they had wanted no bomber aircraft based at their airports. So in order to be able to get the B-26K counter invader into service, it was renamed the A-26, um, because at this time the attack name was brought back into use after, I believe it was in the 19 or mid-1960s where the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force, they combined their, their nomenclature and all the aircraft used a standardized nomenclature across the forces. So instead of the A-1 being the A-D-6, I believe, was what they call it, it became the, the A-1. Uh, you know, a lot of these aircraft got renumbered and renamed. And in that change, the attack designation was brought back, hence we now have the A-10 and all that other stuff. Um, so these were renamed the A-26A, because the A number wasn't used in World War II, only the B and C was used. So these got renamed as the A-26A invaders, and that's what was based, again, it was only officially in U.S. Air Force documentation, but that's what allowed Thailand to have them based. They were based in Thailand and flew into uh, Southeast Asia and did the places like, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and did all their, their missions like that. So it's a bit of a backstory on the aircraft as to why the changes were made and why there's so much confusion over the name and uh, everything else. So that's the backstory. This is, as I said, the ICM kit. So let's get right into it. We'll do a bit of convert, uh, comparisons between parts and you'll see what's going on. It comes in this beautiful box, by the way. Really nice, um, really nice artwork. And then the interior box, which I've never seen before, has like a flap opening side, like a cake box, is how the model is held inside the, uh, the, the nice no, uh, box art. Um, this is the first sort of new generation ICM kit I have. I did have the C45 model before under the Revell brand, but I've never had a modern sort of uh, ICM kit. Some of the newer ones, like the, the Yunkers 88, the HE-111, um, some of their helicopter models and stuff like that, the Bronco. So, so if, this is the first for me to see their new generation kits, and I'm very, very impressed. So the kit itself, because they had the earlier style World War II ones, and now the Counter Invader, and there are quite a bit of differences between the two, the kit sort of comes bagged in two separate packets. You've got this packet, which tends to be all of the uh, World War II parts, minus the fuselage sprue, but everything else in here is what you would get when you bought the World War II kit, and included in it is another bag that has all of the A to the B26K specific parts, including the fuselage. So there's quite a few parts in this section you don't use, and all the parts in this section replace the ones in here you don't need, but you know, for example, on this one you need to have you know, some of these interior bulkheads and some of this, but it includes the wing, so you get an extra World War II wing 
plus the um, K wing um, for the K. So it's a kind of a, you're going to have a lot of spare parts left over when you're done building the K. Um, and it's an interesting way they did it. It feels like it's a lot of waste in terms of extra plastic they're shipping for no need, but it's a lot cheaper than completely retooling and having to have all new tools. The tooling is the money. So instead of retooling all of this, all they did was make a smaller tool for the K model and they just give you the extra World War II plastic. And we'll see, I might end up recycling some of this into, uh, I have two monogram kits, the B and the C, so I might cycle some of these parts over to make one of those look a bit nicer than, than, the, uh, than the other ones. So we'll see what happens, but we'll start looking through with this World War II plastic. I'll start with, I'll start with these sprues here. These are the duplicate sprues you get with the um, cowlings and engines and whatnot. And as they are duplicate, I'm only really gonna show you one. So included on here, uh, you get some of the bombs, exhaust stacks, uh, your gun pods front of the wings, uh, your cowl flaps, the engine itself, which actually comes in four parts. Each bank of, radio, of, of, of cylinders has uh, two halves that have to go together. It's gonna to be interesting to see how that seam comes out. I feel like that might be a really nasty seam to clean up with the two engine halves go together, but we'll see. The uh, World War II style cowling, uh, some of the turret parts, the exhaust collector. These are your sort of cowling frames, uh, some more of the bombs that you use. I think these are the underwing mounted bombs. Um, and then you also got the front of the engine, your wheel hubs, um, and then your World War II prop. Uh, like I said, there's duplicate sprues, so you get two of everything. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, so just quickly zoom in here, you can see the uh, the detailing is actually quite nice. You look at things here, like the engine. There's some nice um, the cooling fins on the radio, and there, you know, the cylinders and stuff like that are not overly done. It's quite nice. You can see. I'll show you on the other ones with some of the panel lines, but things like you know, when you look at the wheel hubs, there's some really nice detail built into the wheel hubs. Um, the uh, the bomb bay uh, structure, it's really nice. The cowling is nice. It's got this internal lip that you would normally see in a real one. It isn't just a smooth system. Uh, you've got that lip that kind of exists on the real cowlings. Um, it's, I mean, the backside it doesn't look right because, you know, no one sees it from the back. But from the front, it has that proper look where it's got sort of that tunnel that leads down into the engine the way you would have normally seen it. So it's got some really nice... Um, detailing things like in here on this rear part of the cowling if you can focus you can kind of see how you've got the really nice panel lining and riveting where that extra panel would be uh, so with some nice proper work on a bit of uh, you know decent painting it should look really really good so anyways on that that's pretty much what you get on these these are sprue D like I said you get two of them and then moving on you got sprue B and Sprue B includes the right wing, as well as the bomb closed bomb doors for the World War II version. And these are the World War II wings. You also get the upper fuselage panel that goes behind the cockpit with the turret ring. And you've got uh, the World War II style rudder, the World War II style um, elevators. And then these are some of your internal bulkheads and whatnot, wheel wells and fuselage bomb bay bulkheads and everything else. And this is where I've saw, you know what? I am showing you this entire thing and I never zoomed out. So, <clears throat> as I was saying, right wing, uh, rear decking with the turret ring, uh, early rudder, elevators, closed bomb bays of the World War II style. These are some of your fuselage bulkheads. I believe these are part of the wheel well and this is another fuselage bulkhead. Now that you've seen everything that comes on sprue B, I'm gonna zoom in and you'll be able to get a good look on how nice some of this panel lining is. So all of those panel lines are there for what you would see in World War II, you know, on the real aircraft. Um, and everything's just finely, finely done and a nice black wash will really make all of that just pop. On the World War II style rudder and the elevators, you can see this beautiful fabric look, just enough that it looks like it's fabric covered, it's not overdone or anything. Uh, on some of these internal bulkheads, you can see how nicely everything is detailed. Uh, just crisp and nice detail. The plastic itself has this really weird kind of soft feel to it. It's not super shiny or oily. It's got this really interesting soft finished and it feels like paint would grab onto it very, very nicely with a good coat of primer. So I'm very happy with how nice that looks. So that was sprue B with the 
um, right hand wing. And then we'll move on to sprue, I believe this is sprue C, and it has the left hand wing, uh, top and bottom. It has the open Bombay doors in the World War II version, and then it includes your engine nacelles along with some of the bulkheads for those engine nacelles. And uh, I mean, it's basically the same detail as the other side, so there's not too much extra to show you on this. Um, Spruce C, that one I can put over here. And then you have Sprue E, uh, which is a mismatch, mix, mishmash of parts. Um, you'll have, I'll start over in this area. This is part of the gunner's area. So you've got the, the sight uh, periscope and some of the, the gunner stuff. You've got your flaps, um, inner and outer flaps. Some of your cockpit spot, uh, butt bits, the center console, some of the uh, sides of the center console. Over here, you've got some of the radio equipment that would go in the back. Uh, you've also got the drop tanks for under the wings. That gives you the choice of using the bombs or the drop tanks. And then over here, you've got um, the nose gear doors, some of your cockpit parts. Um, oh, sorry, these are the main gear doors, cockpit parts, nose gear doors, some of the antennas. And I believe that's part of the rear fuselage. And then you've got the nose guns, the landing gear. Over here, you've got, I believe those are the ailerons, some more bits for inside, some of the landing gear, you got a, one of the control yokes, and this is your eight gun nose um, conversion, or the, the, the eight gun nose. Uh, so they did a version of this, they've released the, uh, the four gun nose where they're arrayed across the side, the glass nose, and the eight gun nose, depending on what version of the kit you get. Um, again, on the back side, the detail's quite nice. If you zoom in and look at some of the, uh, the gear doors, all of the you know lightning holes um, where they had been stamped in the doors originally in the war look really nice. That periscope uh, for the gunner has some really nice detail on it. Um, the landing gear, you know, everything looks scale correct. Lots of nice crisp, you know. There's no softness in the uh, the gear at all. So again, when you paint this up, a bit of a black wash and some dry brushing will make everything just pop beautifully. You look at the instrument panel again. Nice crisp detail. There's no soft blobs in there at all. Uh, there's a decal for the instrument panel, so all of those instruments will just pop when you get it built. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to uh, to get this put together. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that includes the. That is basically it for the World War II um, sprues that come in the kit. As I said, you don't have enough to build a full World War II or Korean airplane, but you have very, very close with the amount of parts they give you. So moving on from there, we have the K model specific parts. And I'm going to start with the, actually to be perfectly honest, uh, this uh, sprue here, sprue A, is also um, straight from the um, original uh, boxing, and I'm 90% sure this is the sprue that would have had the World War II fuselages on each side, because you can see where they literally snipped the sprue off after it was formed. So it looks like they literally took the World War II boxing, gave you every single sprue from the box, except this one, cut off the fuselage halves, and gave you this and kept the fuselage house for something else. And that stops you from building a World War II or Korea era aircraft out of this box. So included on this, you get the, the uh, two horizontal stabs uh, in halves. And you can tell that because you've also got the World War II cockpit floor and the lower turret ring, uh, both of which uh, don't get used on this kit. So all you use are these four horizontal stabs. And I'm 99% sure if you go online and look, your fuselage halves would be on this. So this comes from the World War II part of the boxing as well. And in lieu of that, you get this, which is sprue H. And this includes your K model fuselage. Um, the only the main difference is it's got the little extension here at the rear fuselage for the broader cord rudder. And it includes the beacon at the top that would have been installed in the uh, K model. Other than that, it's basically the same fuselage you would have got in the World War II kit. You also include the broad cord rudder, which you would be using on the K model. The new cockpit floor with dual controls. This is that lower turret piece insert, but the turret ring is actually deleted right from the kit, so it fits in the hole here and blanks off that lower bit. Uh, you also get your new tires. Now, from what I've gathered, these tires are actually bad. I would say this is the weakest point in the kit. I've seen some other comparisons done online. 
all of these tires are slightly too large for the model from what I've gathered online. I haven't done the research myself and actually measured them. <coughs> but the mains are supposed to be the mains off of a 707, a KC135 mains and brakes. And I'd have to do the research of the diameter of a tire and scale it down to 148 and actually do the measurements and see how far off they are. The big issue is there's no tire tread. Being the 707 tire, there should be a radial um, uh, cut where the, the, the tire lines went around the tire like a modern jetliner. And they should be on here and they aren't. They're just bald tires. And I'll show you later why I think this might have been just a miss in the kit and wasn't, you know, specifically designed to be like that. They actually just made a mistake. And I'll show you why in a little bit. But then this is the uh, each screw and like I said, the inside of the fuselage again. You can see the beautiful detail where all of the little boxes and bits and bobs mount in place to fill that in. And again, the, the molding is just beautiful. Like I said, if you zoom in here and you look at the uh, brakes for the main wheels, um, they look just beautiful. Uh, you know, you could clearly get in there and do a lot of detailing work. Same with the main tire rims. I think the nose wheel, I should say. Beautiful, like get some black wash in there. Nice deep, dark, you know, caverns and stuff. So beautiful. There's the hub of the main wheel. Um, it just looks amazing. Uh, so they've definitely put some effort into this kit. Uh, and then we'll move on. Just This is a short little one. This is sprue, I believe it's sprue L. And it's got all of your eight hard points front of the wing, a bunch of the antennas, uh, the extra control uh, column for inside the cockpit. Uh, it's as it's the only version that is dual control. And then some more little bits and bobs and antennas and stuff for the kit. This is just a minor little one, but uh, you need this to make the K model. So then we'll move on to the wings. And I'll start with sprue. Where we have sprue K. And sprue K includes the right wing, as well as the new ailerons. Um, this are some pieces for the rear fuselage. This is all of the pieces for the electronics operator on the back. This is the new bulkhead that goes in that rear area. This is where the turret would have been on the top of the fuselage, and it's replaced by this fully formed blanking plate, so you don't see it. These are the closed bomb bay doors for the, the K version. There's a bunch of cutouts involved. They're blanked off, but on the real one, these are removable panels, so they could install, and I am doing it again. God, I'm bad at that. Okay, quickly go over everything again. Uh, the right-hand wing top and bottom, uh, you got the spots for the hard points. These are all the area for the electronics operator, ailerons. This is some uh, interior structure for the, that rear cabin. This is the cover, top fuselage where the turret would have been that was blanked off. This is the rear bulkhead. Uh, the forward bulkhead for the rear compartment where all of this stuff all mounts to. Uh, this is the bomb bays, that's cl uh, closed version of the bomb bay. And as I said, there's all these little cutouts involved. And that's because this aircraft had the option to remove these panels and install cameras and sensors and whatnot for a reconnaissance version that never really got used. But the cutouts were existing in the door. And these are those new props that I was talking about. So I'm going to quickly zoom in and I'll show you some details on this and compare them with the World War II version that I still have sitting here on the side. So for a sense of Bombay, there was all those little blanking plates I was telling about the squares and circles. So that's how it looked on the K model. If you look at the same part for the World War II version, it's just a straight door where the K has all those little bits and bobs. So that's the difference for that part. Again, you look at the props. They're these squared off. They are, like I said, I'm 99% sure it was a cut down uh, DC-7 prop that they used. And you can compare that to the original World War II props. You get a much broader cord prop. And these were also uh, reversible. So you could get reverse thrust to use them on smaller runways. And then that rear fuselage um, cover, this one here, which is just forward. The cockpit would be here and your rear compartment would be here. And then this is how the part looks from the World War II kit. And you can see how the difference, and you can actually see, if I zoom out a little bit, how um, it's actually the exact same sprue. Just read these two corners got changed, but otherwise it's exactly the same. Now the last thing that the difference between these two kits are the wings. And the World War II, you see it's this nice smooth wing. The K, had this strengthening plate. These steel strips were mounted top and bottom of the wings uh, over here. And that was the strengthening strips they needed to give the wings the strength to have these hard points. So they're beautifully molded on all the little tiny um, rivets that stick up the way it would have been on the actual airframe. Um, again, a bit of dry brushing on that just to show some paint wear and it'll look amazing. 
So that's the difference between the World War II wing and the Korean wing and the World War II props and the Korean props. So the last screw we have for the Korean War, or the Vietnam War, I should say, version is this one, which is screw J. And it includes now the left wing, again, exactly the same as the other one. You get your new cowlings, and again, see the difference in the cowlings, you can kind of compare um, this cowling here, um, I can zoom in here quickly to show you. So this cowling here, it's got this big cutout at the top, and the intake is actually mounted behind here on the actual um, um, like, I'm trying to think of the word. The actual nacelle is where the intake was, whereas in the World War II cowling, the intake was mounted flush with the front. So you can kind of see the difference there on the two cowlings. Now this one, as they had in World War II, worked when they upgraded to the more powerful engines, they were having overheating issues. So then the, the later version, the Vietnam War era one has, I might be saying Korean War a lot, I apologize. The Vietnam era one, the counter invader had a much larger intake to increase airflow to help with those cooling issues. Uh, so you also have the intakes themselves. You've got the drop tanks. Uh, they don't even drop tanks, I shouldn't say that. They're tip tanks. They were non-removable tip tanks that were mounted on the airframe. The open version of the bomb bay doors, if you want to go open. Now there's also these parts here. Um, this part here and this part here go together. And that creates the new front to the engine. Um, these more powerful engines they had installed on the counter invader had a different sort of gear reduction on the front. So whereas the World War II uses these engines with this gear reduction, the Vietnam counter invader uses the same engine core, but these different gear reduction housings on the front to give it the look of the later model engines. So the other issue, uh, issue the other part you get is the new, um, well you also get a new center console. The center console is different, so you get the top and the two sides of the center console. And you also get the new instrument panel. Uh, this is the full dual control panel as compared to, oh, I don't even have it out anymore, the World War II panel. So you can see the difference. There's the, uh, where are we here? The World War II panel and then the late Vietnam era panel is the full dual control. So that was done at the factory by Armark and made it a full dual control um, uh, invader. Now the interesting thing is that upper panel that I showed you in the fuselage in the previous sprue that blanks over where the turret ring would go on the top of the fuselage. On the bottom of that is a little insert and this is the insert that goes in there and it still has the round opening. So it shows how the internal structure still, which I think you can see when you look up in the bomb bay, if memory serves, that internal structure where the turret would normally fit through. Internally, you can still see that circle structure for the turret, but on the back side, it would be completely skinned over with a new skin. And it's very, very accurate to the way it was in real life. I'm very impressed with the amount of work that um, uh, ICM has put into making the differences between an early model and a K known. It's very, very close. And the only issue again were those tires. And we'll take a look at that in a little bit when we start going through the instructions. So we're gonna take a quick look at instructions now. Uh, they come in these beautiful full color um, glossy paper. Uh, the pages, the two last pages, the first and last. So the two outer pages of the instructions are nice high gloss paper. And that I believe is for the painting instructions. They are on this nice high gloss, high quality paper to get all of the tiny little details printed on it where the rest is a standard flat paper. And I believe the ink would run on this a little bit more than this. And this gives the high quality for here, but saves the money on the inside where you don't need it. So instructions again, bit of a rundown on what you need. It shows you the color callouts for ICM colors, as well as the European Revell colors and Tamiya colors. Luckily, they're pretty much the standard colors. So you'll just have to do a bit of research to convert to whatever brand you happen to use. This is the parts breakdown for the World War II sections. And you can see how many of those World War II section parts we don't use on this kit. And all the parts that aren't being used are either deleted or replaced by the K model parts, which you see on this side. <coughs> Excuse me. So, parts breakdown. Uh, clear parts, I haven't talked about the clear parts yet. Clear parts are right here. It has both the early flat top and the later bubble top canopy. 
As you can see, we don't use the flat top. We just use this later style bubble top canopy. I'm a little upset that they don't include the ability to open these doors. It looks really cool with the doors open on the, uh, the upper cowl canopy doors swing open like a clamshell. And it looks really cool with it open. I understand it's a very hard thing to mold and why they didn't include it, but it would have been nice to show the interior. But anyways, clear parts are beautiful. Uh, very little uh, distortion in the clear. They're very clear, very crisp. Um, they also include the area that's to be painted is a frosted look where the window isn't. I think that'll just allow that paint to grab a little bit better. So again, nice touch by ICM. So moving through the instructions, very well laid out, very clear. Uh, you start off building the interior bombs for the bomb bay. Uh, you then install some of that. You'll see here some of the newer, like the J and the K. These are all the new pieces that were added to the, the K model that are different from the World War II version uh, just because of the difference in, in the interior. And then down here is that rear uh, compartment, all of the uh, great you know, systems, uh, electronic boxes, the black boxes that we used, as well as everything else in the seat. You then install all of that stuff, including the interior bulkheads, onto the fuselage. You move out of the cockpit, center console gets assembled, uh, the extra rudder pedals and uh, your control yokes get installed. Uh, your new instrument panel, uh, the seats, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think the color callouts for the whole cockpit, it says lime green, which is sort of that interior green color that the Americans used. Yeah, I'd have to do the research on that and see. I have a feeling the cockpits were painted black in the Vietnam one. I'd have to do my research on that, so don't quote me on it. And then moving over on to step by 22, we're already 22 on the second page. Uh, the rear compartment gets glued in. There's some of these strengthening pieces. Oh, sorry, this is the cockpit. Um, then these strengthening pieces get glued in um, that I think were installed as part of the uh, K model uh, mod. They get glued in. The right hand side gets the nose gear doors and the bombs installed and you make the fuselages. Then over here is horizontal stabs, elevators, rudder, all of that gets installed. Then we do the nose gear, sorry, the nose itself, the gun nose. Uh, it's kind of a multi-part, four-part piece. Hopefully that goes together smooth and it has nice alignment tabs so you don't get the whole thing kind of off-center. You know, if you can make a circle, you can kind of make the circle off-center and then it wouldn't fit properly. So I'm hoping, knowing the, the quality of this kit, I'm assuming this has some nice locating tabs to ensure everything stays properly aligned so when you glue it to the fuselage, it all fits. The other option is to glue these three pieces onto the fuselage as you're assembling it, and that lines everything up properly, and then this piece can just be fitted on after with the guns installed. It does call for 40 grams of weight in the nose if you want to go with the gear on down option, which it makes it difficult to go gear up the way the gear doors are molded on. <clears throat> so you do have to find the weight to put in the nose. I kind of wish some of these kits would include the weights. If you mold in a pocket and like a ball bearing, or the way Tamiya does it with some of their cylinders, and a molded in pocket, it would make life a lot easier. But hey, who am I to complain? Next page, we start working on the right-hand wing, assembling everything with the flaps, the uh, ailerons, all that kind of stuff. And then down here, we install with the tip tank. And then the next page is the opposite for the other wing. Nothing too crazy there. Here, we assemble the wings. Then we move on to the nacelles. This is the left nacelle, the bulkheads, the gear doors, everything gets assembled. Then we do the right nacelle. Then we assemble all of the bits here with the intake and and uh, the forward half of the nacelle and that gets installed and then everything gets mounted to the wings. We then move on and we do this upper cover to cover the top of the bomb bay and upper fuselage. So this is the piece that replaces the turret ring. And as I said, you can see here the insert that goes in with the turret ring structure. So from internally, it looks like the structure is there, but externally it's skinned over. Uh, there's also, a, you have to kind of, it shows you your measurements. You got to measure out and drill for two holes for some of the antennas. And you also have to do it on the clear canopy as well um, for the antennas that get fitted to this. And then the clear pieces are assembled at this point. Um, and then back here, here's the blanking plate for the lower turret. And then all of the uh, the wheels, landing gear, nose, mains. <coughs> Excuse me, all of that gets assembled. And then the gear gets installed. Luckily, you can install everything after the fact, which makes painting much, much easier. You then move on to the engines. As I said, there's quite a bit that goes into the engines. The cores get built. Then your forward uh, reduction gear housings get built. Everything gets glued onto those. And then there's the rings, the structure rings kind of to hold so the cowlings would attach to that structure. Not a lot of kits include that, and it's nice that they have. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you have all of the exhaust stacks that get installed, and then all of that gets mounted onto the, um, the cells. 
The next step is gluing the nacelles on. I'm gonna have to look at how everything fits because I really like the look of the engines and I'm hoping this has a nice positive fit so I can take the, I mean, I guess the props are gonna be on so I can't really take the cowling off, but um, it'd be nice to be able to just like remove a prop and pull the cowling off and show that engine detail off if you wanted to. It all depends on how well those cowlings fit. My other option is to just assemble it without the cowling on to show off an engine, but that all depends on how realistic all of this looks and fits together. But a beautiful, beautiful engines on this if I can get them cleaned up and built nice. Like I also said, that seam that lives across the top of the cylinder heads might mean I can't really show it off depending on how dirty they look or how easy they clean up. So a little bit of investigation needs to be done in there, but there's lots of potential for a diorama with the beautiful engine being shown under maintenance. The next two steps are the cowls, upper, lower cowl flaps. You then get to the bomb bays, choice of open or closed, as well as some of the antennas that get mounted. <clears throat> next step, you get all the antennas on the top of the fuselage that get assembled. Here you do your... Um, Underwing hard points, they are sided, so you've got to be careful. Uh, step 97 is for your uh, right wing, step 98 is for your left wing, so you make sure you don't get those mixed up. It looks like you have to drill the hole if you want to mount weapons, so if you don't want to mount them, they look a little accurate without a hole. If you do want them, you drill the hole and uh, makes for the positive fit. And here we go at step 100, the props are assembled. And then there's the finished kit. And it also shows here for the weapons, uh, kind of a, a, a loadout chart of four different loadouts that this aircraft could carry and what station each weapon goes on. Uh, you can always do your research and look at something, and if you find something online that doesn't match this, but there's pictorial evidence of it being carried, and by all means, it's your model, you can do what you want. But that is nice that they added that, because you don't. a lot of times doing the research to find out typical loadouts can be very difficult. Um, and there are specific ways that weapons got carried. You can't just put anything anywhere because of drag and dropping angle and stuff like that. It's all, you know, aerodynamics. But there were specific ways to load, so it's nice that they include that. Here it includes a mask template. It never provided masking, so I'm assuming this is for you to cut, you know, use as a, a trace to cut the size to match the windows. Um, I've never seen it done this way. It's kind of cool because you can photocopy and cut it out and trace on tape and cut it out and lay it on. I think it would also just be easy to lay the tape and cut around the window the way I normally do it. So, you know, it depends on what you choose to do. But that's an option if you go that route as well. Um, but I also don't know if it was supposed to have some sort of a masking material that it just wasn't included in my kit or if it wasn't included in any of the A26K models. Now, before I forget, talking about this kit, specifically the wheels. If you look at the instructions, the kit instructions show the tread, the radial tread that is supposed to be on the tires. It shows it everywhere you see the tires. You see it there, you know, you see it there. As I just showed you, you see it there. You know, you see it there. Even the section where it tells oh, you, know, you see it there. Even the section where it tells you to build the landing gear, you see the tread molded on the tires. But the actual kit has nothing. So I don't know whether it was supposed to have the tread and they forgot to like design it like that way or if it initially did have tread. Now to put an indented tread, your mold would have to have a lip. And I'm wondering if they had designed it that way, but because of the way the mold pops off, it wasn't working properly and somehow that undercut lip was causing problems with the mold. And the way they fixed it was to just grind off the mold and make a flat tire. I don't know. I'm. I have no inside information, but I'm, those are my two theories. Either one, they actually forgot to cut the molds with the tire treads, or they were having issues with the tires not forming properly or the mold not releasing properly. And to expedite the release, they just modified the mold and got rid of that detail. I don't know. <coughs> you might have to go with an aftermarket wheel if you're worried about it or try to scribe that detail on. You know, it is what it is. So moving into the marking options, obviously all four options are Vietnam era scheme. They're all the three color, medium green, dark green, uh, sack bomber tan over black. Um, 
This one here is aircraft 6417651, 56th Special Operations Wing, 69th Special Operations Squadron, based in Thailand in 1969. And it's interesting as it does have some nose art. Mighty Mouse painted on the side, so that's always nice. Next one here, this is a Sweet Therese, um, which is also the same thing, uh, 6417649. It's labeled as Davis Monthman. Monthan Air Force Base. That's the graveyard. So I have a feeling that ICM used a picture of this sitting in the boneyard as their reference, and that's what they marked. But being that it still says TA, 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 I would assume that this also belonged to the 56th Special Operations Wing of the 609th Special Operations Squadron when it operated in Vietnam. You'll also see here the difference. I'll show you on the decal. Some of them have black walkways with the red outline, and some have just the red outline. But I'll show you that on the decal sheet. Next one here has no name on it, but this is a 6417645 56 Special Operations Wing, 609th Special Operations Squadron, based in Thailand in 1969. Last but not least, we have this aircraft. This is Special K 6417679 from the first Special Operations Wing, based in the U.S. Air Force USAF uh, in 1960s. I don't. I'm assuming this was also overseas, but just a different unit from these guys. Um, this one's interesting because this one still flies today as a warbird. Uh, it was the only K model to survive in a condition that could be restored to flying, and it currently flies. I believe it's based in Texas, and it currently flies on the, on the air show circuit as a warbird. And uh, that's I, you know you've, you've got that option as well. Looking at the decals, you've got. I've never seen them with this blue backing paper, but I mean it is what it is. Very basic props. Uh, cockpit. These are your wing walks with the black and non-black. You've got all your tail markings with your nose art and then uh, over here you've got uh, your emergency cut lines and you've also got uh, number 24. It's the end registry and that's the end registration for Special K as it flies today. So you could build Special K as a world a Vietnam War example or you could do it up as today's air show example and use the civilian registrations. So that is the uh, B-26 counter invader kit. Now Interestingly, which I wasn't aware of until I got this kit, the kit also includes ICM's Vietnam War weapons pack. So you can buy this as a separate kit, but they've included it in this kit uh, because of the nature of the, biz of the uh, nature of the business, the nature of the aircraft and the weapons it carried. It's included. So you get four sprues, two duplicates of each, and includes a bunch of different weapons. And I'll quickly show you what you get. So the instructions again, it shows you the sprue layouts, two of each. Simple the basic building of each aircraft. And then on the back, it shows you the painting guides for all the weapons, including the weapons you get. So you get BLU-23 napalm canisters, either with or without, um, excuse me, tails, and you get two, one on each sprue. The BLU-27 napalm with or without tails, and you get two, one on each sprue. You get the Lao-10 rocket launcher and the Lao-68 rocket launcher. And it looks like you get um, two of each, one on each sprue, one here and one here. There's also the Lao 69 rocket launcher. You get two, one on each sprue, one here, one there. The Mark 77, which was a firebomb. It's not napalm, but it's a similar style. You get two, one here, one on each sprue. You get Mark 81's low drag and snake eyes. It looks like you only get, um, let's see here, you get two. Two of the, the low drag and two of the snake eye, one on each version. Same with the Mark 82, low drag and snake eye, one of each version, on so two of each. You also get the SUU-14 rocket launcher here, two, one on each sprue. And then the mare, multiple ejection rack, and you get two, one on each sprue. Um, so you get quite a bit involved in this, uh, two of each weapon you see, which is a very, very, you know, extensive weapon package to just kind of throw in this kit for free, but, uh, it's worth it. And then the kit itself also includes the weapons kit. Come on. The weapons kit itself includes its own little decal sheet with your stencils and the lines and everything. For that. So the only thing you have to worry about is so the yellow on the front of the bombs. The red is included here and there's silver decals on the rocket launcher that are included here and then all of it. Oh, you know what? I take that back. Uh, where's decal 5? It looks like they give you decals for the yellow band 
on the front of the bombs if you choose to go that route. So, yeah, there you go. You learn something new every day. Anyway, very, very interesting that they included that for free. I'm happy with that. So that is the extent of this kit. It is a very extensive kit. They went to great lengths to make sure they captured all the changes that were included between the World War II and Korea versions and the K version. Now, I don't even know when I'm going to start construction of this model. Uh, it is going to be a long-term kit. I don't know when I'm going to get to it, but I will. So keep an eye out on the channel for whenever you, you know, I'm, I don't know. It's just going to one day I'm going to decide to build it and you'll start to see the build log and everything go up on that. So keep your eye out on that. Okay, so I don't know when I'm going to get to building that, but keep an eye out on the channel and uh, I will have it up eventually. You guys can follow the build log. If there's anything you guys want to see specifically with this kit, fire me off. Question, I can take pictures, let you know whatever you want to know. But uh, yeah, there we go. That is the ICM B26 Counter Invader from IC uh, ICM in 148 scale. Thanks for watching.